Okay, so I have very little time. I have a lot to say about this. This was a last minute presentation change because of everything that's happened in the week or so. I'm going to talk to you about royalty rights. It's the elephant or the mammoth in the room, I would say. And uh, yeah, my name is Yat. I'm chairman of a company called Animoca Brands. Digital property rights and royalties is near and dear to our heart. Um, quickly talking about the next slide. Where's the slide? Oh no. Okay, so. First, you already know what's going on. You know, I guess the good is that NFT, royalty, uh, NFT volume is up, but the bad is, of course, that actually what's happening with all this controversy is that just to put the numbers in, we've now come to a point where royalties are effectively close to zero, and this gives you a chart to see that from one year ago, 100% royalties were paid to now basically generally close to 0%. The net effect is that something like 18,000 uh, worth of ETH plus has been lost to creators. In today's value, that's roughly $35 million that's not gone to creators and will continue unless something changes. So why this is, of course, important is that the whole point about Web3 is that it aligns the network effects between the people who are using it, the creators, the owners, and perhaps even the platforms. And what we're seeing right now is the antithesis of this. Let me elaborate that. First, um, what is Web3? What are we fighting for? So the whole point about Web3 is that we get to share and benefit from the shared network effect that exists. In other words, if you're using something on an L1 blockchain, if you're owning a collection in an NFT collection, you get to benefit from the entire benefit of the ecosystem by owning one or two or three or whatever number it is. That's one way to benefit. In the Web2 world, that benefit was accrued to the platforms. So we think of this as something that is free, but actually nothing is free. You're using Facebook, they farm your data. You think you get it for free. They pay for the server costs. In reality, they take all your data, and they take all the value that's generated from that data. In the Web3 construct, actually, it's sharing and sustaining that. Right? In other words, when you're using the platform, when you're using you know, Ethereum, for instance, we all pay gas right, as a mechanism to support the infrastructure, to maintain the sanctity and the strength of the network. And as a result of that, we also have a way for that network to evolve to where that is today. It's funded this way. And our perspective is that royalties to creators is essentially another kind of gas. It is the gas of the NFT world, and it's important to have that. And that's also another way in which you benefit from that network effect, and that's what we're all fighting for. Now, if you didn't have royalties, uh, then you wouldn't be able to have the benefits that we see today, what's happening with Bored Apes, for instance, or Cool Cats, or Azuki, or any other project that's out there. There wouldn't be a business model around free mints. But how does it work in sharing the network effect? It works because the, the, the uh, sort of like a company like Yuga can actually allow you to participate through a very relatively low cost into the uh, ecosystem. But who gives value to the Yuga ecosystem? It's not specifically just Yuga itself. It's every person who owns a board ape, who's going out and you know, making burger joints, who's going out basically building sort of a product or is promoting it, and who benefits? Every other person who also owns a board ape. But how can you have participation in this when the entry cost is high? So Yuga has made hundreds of millions of dollars in royalties, which then bred an ecosystem that allowed for things like mutants and kennel dogs and eventually the other deed, um, you know, what happened with ApeCoin. And you see this with all of these other projects. So what's actually happening is, is that system that some people say they don't like is actually a benefit that has paid forward because it essentially is the equivalent of protecting, in this case, the ecosystem that is Yuga and any other project out there. So the incentive alignment is strong um, if you do it this way. And if you don't have royalties, you won't have that. And the same goes for teachers. You know, people are selling teacher NFTs, for instance, where they earn royalties. If you don't have royalties on that, teachers don't get additional income from this. This is not just about artists. It's for all sorts of creators um, in the world. And that's exactly why Web3 is so powerful and why you need continued creator fees and royalties. All right. So this comes to this thing known as the tragedy of commons, which happens when you have the free rider effect. You know, you can study this online, I won't go too much into it, but the whole point is this, that when people believe that you can extract a service which actually has, you know, a, is a common benefit, and just a few people take away from it, right, then you think it's okay because, you know, everyone else is paying for it. If I don't have to pay for it, then who cares, right? Sometimes we think about this about taxes. Sometimes we think about the best digital content. Often we think about this in the context of pollution as well. You know, if everyone, if everyone is generally keeping the environment clean and I kind of pollute it a little bit, then maybe it doesn't seem so bad and it doesn't really matter. But it has long-term effects. And the way we think of this is that the free rider effect here is that those people who trade 
and don't pay a royalty fee affect the system because they're not paying for it. And eventually you have what happens, which is market failure. And when market failure happens, it's because there's not enough value and money that goes back into the ecosystem to maintain it, which is the reason why public goods, for instance, like you know, um, you know, security services and so on, tend to be public goods because there's a free riding effect. So you pay for it in a different way. You pay for it in the form of taxes. So it's not really free riding. You're paying the government to maintain these services because the community itself might not. But in this case, we're talking about private enterprise. And there's some good examples how the tragedy of commons has affected because of the free rider effect. The most famous example, obviously, is music. So for those of you old enough to remember, you know, in the 80s and maybe early 90s, music was a fairly thriving business. And then you had, basically, music piracy emerge with things like Napster and Pirate Bay and all that kind of stuff. And the tragic thing was that it became normal not to pay for music. Music was something that nobody would pay for. Right? It was just not something that we respected. Um, you know, it's not even about whether you go into a store and discover music, or whether it's about HMV or any of these brands that you may have heard of. Most of you might be too young. Um, it's the fact that we've now become accustomed as a norm that music shouldn't be paid for. And that has created a problem in terms of what's happening with musicians, which I'll get to. But when you take a look at, for instance, you know, after the introduction of streaming, which was a centralized version of protecting music rights, with the rise of Spotify and Apple Music, you saw revenue for musicians increase. So obviously, that seemed to have a benefit because now at least you could quasi-police it. But the value was so low that today, even though we have you know, something like six, seven billion dollars worth of music royalties being paid out, musicians can't survive on music alone. And I think you know the story, I don't have to belabor it too much. But basically, you know, making music and having it streamed gives you paid almost nothing. It's like a promotional tool. And who benefits? the platforms. This, is, by the way, is not just true for, for, for Spotify, it's true for Facebook, it's true for Amazon, it's true for every company that basically has control in a centralized manner. And that's actually the issue here which we need to protect for. It's an example of how music basically sort of um, got destroyed from the value that it actually used to have. Now, public blockchains, metaverse, non-fungible tokens and so on, we think of them as a construction of a national economy. And so that's why things like you know, free riding and public goods and common goods are really important here. Let me give you an example here. Um, so, the creative aspect of any economy, when we talk about, you know, national economies, is actually driven very much by arts and culture. Last year, close to $900 billion uh, of basically sort of service-related revenue came from arts and culture in the U.S. alone which is basically making it the second largest sort of industry in terms of economic activity, employing millions and millions of people. Very, very important. But perhaps more important than just the fact that it's driving close to a trillion dollars of value to the US economy is the fact that the effect of culture drives much, much more value overall as an ecosystem. If you don't have culture, you don't have Netflix, you don't have Sony PlayStation, you don't have HBO, you don't have Marvel, you don't have Hollywood. It's the biggest, most important soft power in the world. Now imagine living in a country that has low culture. We have opinions about this, right? You know, in some places, people might have an opinion about American culture, but American culture is perhaps the biggest soft power there is. Because of Hollywood, the American dollar has actually influence. The value isn't the fact that it has just a strong military and the fact that it has a powerful currency and an economy. It's the fact that it has influence. Its values, its ideas, its culture, all of these things, its memes, as you were, is the reason why it has power. And it comes from the fact that in the US, generally speaking, these type of arts and culture rights are protected, and that allows it for an economy to grow. And the risk is, of course, if we don't protect it in the Web3 world, then do we get to a point of an example which I'm going to show you, which is China. So for those who remember, China was the number one piracy place in the world. Trillions and trillions of software was pirated. And it wasn't just fake Rolexes. It was fake software, fake Microsoft, fake everything. And from the earliest years up until the early 2000s, you could literally walk in a store in broad daylight and just buy a pirated version of you know, Windows 2000 or 98 or whatever copy you wanted, and nobody would stop you. And back then they said, that's fine, we're free riding. We're free riding on you know, the innovation and creation of you know, companies from around the world. But there was a much more insidious effect. And the insidious effect is, if you notice also, that there was absolutely almost no intellectual development that happened up until they started protecting it. Why would you be a software developer if you can't make money in software in China? Why would you create any kind of digital content if it would just get pirated? And certainly the American companies were trying to protect it, 
But actually what they realize is that if they don't protect these rights, they would basically become digital you know, Neanderthalers because they didn't have a way of protecting it. So in around 2000, China started to basically enforce the rights. They changed the patent laws. And you can see, this is just Shenzhen, but today China is the largest producer of patents, even ahead of the US, from coming from nowhere. Um, you know, and what's interesting is that when they enact these laws and started to enforce them, sending basically sort of people who violated the law to, into jail, that's when the software industry and the development industry and the creative industry in China started to grow. The point is, you have to protect the rights of these creators, these developers. Otherwise, you'll destroy the very ecosystem that you're trying to build and defend. And I think China is a great example, but there's other countries. Think of the countries that do not have good copyright enforcement today, who do not protect the intellectual property. What software development do you see there? What innovation is being created there? What creativity can actually flourish? The answer is generally very little. Which is the reason why we at Animoca Brands have an approach that we think could help the whole royalty debate. We've issued this already a few months ago, but then it seemed like it wasn't so important, but now it's important again. Uh, as Creative Commons, we issued a multiple set of licenses that provide a kind of legal protection framework for creators right now. In the same way that we think it needs to be enforced in the physical world, we think this kind of enforcement could work in the digital world. And I get to the specifics on this. You can download it for free, you can adapt it. We recognize this because most artists and creators in the world, the first thing you don't do is hire a lawyer. We get it, right? It's not the first expense you want to put out. Which means you're issuing your content without actually thinking about the rights management. And what the license agreement does, it's inspired basically on sort of the way the Digital Millennium Copyrights Act works, is that if you use this NFT license, that if you fail to pay royalty as a marketplace, not as the end user, then there is an enforcement mechanism around there because you're now accruing liability as long as you give notice to that marketplace. This has precedent, which I'll explain shortly, because it comes in the form of copyright. It also means that all of you uh, have to consider how you copyright your material. Some of the material that you copyright has to be registered. In some countries, you don't. But the point being that you can have copyright protection and use those laws to protect your rights. And then what then happens is that once you give them a notice, if they still don't comply, they do start to accrue liability. Whether you enforce it or not is a different question. I'll come to that. We have actually a precedent on this. The most famous case was, of course, YouTube versus Viacom. While this case was settled out of court, the net effect was that YouTube basically agreed to pay royalties on all the content that was used for other creators, not just Viacom at that moment in time. And it was settled out of court, probably because YouTube didn't want an actual court law because who knows what would have come out of this. And this has happened with video game companies, it happened with Napster versus Metallica, it happened with all of these industries. And the result, of course, is that it had a net benefit for the entire industry. And today you can do that as well. If some of your copyrighted material was seen on YouTube, YouTube, through the safe harbor, is able to say, I didn't know about it, so I don't have a penalty. However, once you send them a notice and you say, let me tell you that there's an infringement, they typically take it down. And that's because why accrue liability? Which has the same effect as removing it from the infringing marketplace. But our perspective would be that if you're a marketplace and you still want to trade them, may as well just honor the royalty, very little cost, as opposed to potentially accrue potential liability. Now there's an argument that people make that you know, it's not market efficient. You know, you know, humans are greedy and we're capitalists and therefore everything we do must be optimized. That's certainly a tr certain kind of trader perspective. But we have many examples in the physical world today that we're willing to pay a premium for sustainability. How much do you pay for something that's green or something that's electric or something that's carbon friendly? If we didn't think that, we wouldn't drive Teslas, we'd buy you know, the cheapest car out there. We buy and invest in things, not just because it has value right this moment in time, because we want it to be sustainable in the long term. We do this as people all the time. So this isn't about short-term profits, it's about sustainable profits, it's what the ethos of Web3 is like. By paying royalties, by honoring that, it's not just good for the ecosystem, it's also creating a sustainable ecosystem. And it creates what typically is defined by a lot of market economists as the triple bottom line. So it's not just about profit, it's about other elements which we're seeing much more in corporations. And I would argue that even though in Web3 we don't articulate a triple bottom line, through the effect of the shared network effect, we're kind of already there. So let me close with this thought. I only have you know, a little bit of time. This was an interesting test done in the 60s or 70s 
by uh, George Land and Beth Jarman. It was a test to see originally when a NASA scientist would apply for a job, whether they were very good at divergent thinking, as in how creative could they solve a problem? Because you know, back then, and even today, if you fly someone to the moon and you know, shit happens, you want to make sure that you have a really, really creative engineer that can solve it because you don't have a guidebook that says, if something happens in the moon, what do you do? So they took that same test and made some variations and applied it to children to see how creative they were. Children on the age of five were basically genius level creative people. 98% solved that problem. This is research that you can find outside. By the time they were around 10, it dropped to 30%. By the time they were teenagers, it was 12%. And the adults that were tested, most of us in this room, we only scored 2%. Now, this may not be very, very surprising. I would also argue that the majority of the people, if not all of us here in this conference, actually are part of that 2% because you're probably divergent thinkers. You're probably the kind of people who think differently, which is why you're in NFTs and blockchain and all that crazy stuff. Um, but anyway, the point being is that the majority of the world as business has been educated out of creati creativity. Why am I sharing this? Well, first of all, we're born creative. We're not made creative. Creativity is our natural nature. It's who we are. Which means that what we're fighting for isn't just the rights of a musician or the rights for an artist. It's the rights for all of us. When we create data, when we're using Facebook, when we're interacting, we're actually giving some of our juice. We're giving some of our data, some of our insights, some of our creativity. Creators are the backbone of all culture. We know that. But culture is the backbone of all economies, which is what I demonstrated earlier as well. We talk a lot about capitalism. This is what this is. The protection of private property rights is what makes capitalism work. It also gives us our freedom. This is obviously ensconced in the Constitution, ensconced in all of the sort of, uh, sort, of, uh, sort of political systems around the world that are democratic. The same is true for digital. When we talk about fees and royalties, it is a property right of the creator. It is for the creator to decide. If he wants to do 0% royalties to engage, have market share, that's fine. He can do so. But it's not for someone else to say, hey, I want to just change your royalty rights and gain market share. I mean, that's what Spotify is doing, that's what Facebook's doing. We don't even know what they're making. So this is an absolute impingement of our rights as people. So I'm going to close, ah, so, and this one, you know, well, the other thing is strong property rights correlates to freedoms and democratic systems. And this is something, again, that's been well studied. The countries that have strong property rights, the countries that have, you know, protection of intellectual property, have the highest GDPs in the world, have also generally the best liberties. The countries that don't, say North Korea, have very low GDPs, very low income, no rights, and also no freedoms. So that's the extreme. So when we're thinking about protecting property rights here, the rights of creators as an example, or for all of us, we're not just thinking about protecting the rights of you know, a certain subset of people. It's about the entire framework of these new kind of national economies that we're looking to build. I'll close with this. We're in Paris, we're in France, where it all happened, the Declaration of Rights of Men, uh, the Marquis de Lafayette obviously famously wrote this quote about sort of liberty. I thought it was apropos. Liberty consists in the freedom to do everything which injures no one else, amongst other things, of course. What it means is that we have the liberty to do whatever we want. We have the liberty to protect all our rights, so long that we don't impinge and violate the rights of others. Marketplaces that take from creators are violating the rights of others and is hurting the entire ecosystem. And the way that we should respond is to honor the royalties and fight back. Thank you.